Well, 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 SpaceX haven't done this before. But why did they hover the super heavy booster before splashdown during Flight 11? Hey, I'm Lucas. Welcome to the SpaceX community. Let's get started. The 11th integrated flight test, known as Flight 11 or IFT-11, marked a pivotal moment in this ambitious project. Launched on October 15th, 2025, from Starbase in Boca Chica, Texas, this test flight focused on refining the reusability aspects of the vehicle, particularly the Super Heavy Booster's landing capabilities. Central to this mission was a novel hover maneuver attempted during the booster's descent, a technique aimed at simulating the precision required for future tower catches. Flight 11 utilized Booster 15-2 and Ship 38, the final iteration of the Block 2 design before transitioning to Block 2-3. The launch occurred from Pad 1, the original launch site at Starbase. All 33 Raptor engines ignited flawlessly, propelling the massive vehicle skyward with over 17 million pounds of thrust. The ascent was nominal, with no engine outages during the initial phase, a testament to the iterative improvements SpaceX has made since earlier flights. As the rocket climbed through the atmosphere, it reached max Q, the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure, without incident. Hot staging occurred around 2 minutes and 45 seconds into the flight, where the booster's engines shut down, while the ship's engines ignited, separating the stages. This technique, a first successfully demonstrated in previous tests, allows for more efficient use of propellant and reduces the risk of stage separation failures. Following separation, the ship continued on its suborbital trajectory, conducting tests such as Raptor engine relight in space, a payload deployment simulation using Starlink dummies, and a heat shield stress test during re-entry. These objectives were crucial for gathering data on orbital performance and atmospheric entry, but the spotlight of this flight undeniably shone on the booster's return. The Super Heavy booster, after staging, executed a flip maneuver to orient itself for the return journey. This was followed by the boost back burn, initiated with 13 outer ring engines. Notably, one engine failed to relight during this phase, but the remaining 12 compensated effectively, adjusting the burn duration to maintain the planned trajectory. This anomaly was the only minor hiccup in an otherwise perfect mission, and interestingly, the same engine relit successfully later during the landing burn. Such resilience highlights the robustness of the Raptor engine design, and the flight computer's ability to adapt in real time. As the booster arced back towards Earth, it jettisoned its hot staging ring, a component that protects the engines during separation. In Block 2 boosters, this ring is detachable, allowing it to fall away into the Gulf of Mexico. Future Block 3 designs integrate this feature into the forward section, streamlining the vehicle. The booster then entered a controlled glide, using its grid fins to steer towards the designated splashdown zone in the Gulf. This phase is critical for aligning the descent path, ensuring the booster approaches the target area with the precision needed for safe operations. Approaching the landing zone, the booster ignited its landing burn with all 13 engines initially targeted for the boost back. The burn progressed smoothly, with the system down-selecting engines in stages to fine-tune the descent velocity. First, it reduced to five engines, then to the final three center engines. This multi-stage shutdown is a strategic evolution from previous flights, providing greater redundancy and control during the terminal phase. By spreading out the engine shutdowns, SpaceX engineers can better manage thrust asymmetry and ensure a stable approach which is vital for eventual tower catches where millimeter precision is required. The hover maneuver itself was the crowning achievement of Flight 11's booster operations. With the three center Raptor engines firing, the super heavy booster achieved a stable hover approximately 50 meters above the ocean surface. This brief suspension, 
lasting several seconds, simulated the final moments before a mechanical catch by the launch tower's chopstick arms. The hover allowed engineers to test the booster's ability to maintain position and orientation under thrust, counteracting gravity while minimizing lateral movement. Footage from onboard cameras and nearby drones captured this surreal sight. The colossal booster hanging vertically in the air, flames roaring from its base, against a backdrop of calm ocean waves and a clear blue sky. The purpose of this hover was multifaceted. Primarily, it served as a dress rehearsal for the tower catch planned for future flights, where the booster must align perfectly with the Mechazilla arms. By hovering over water, SpaceX could safely test the dynamics without risking damage to ground infrastructure. Additionally, the maneuver provided valuable data on engine throttling, gimballing, and overall vehicle stability at low velocities. The three-engine configuration offers a balance between thrust and control. Too many engines might overwhelm the system, while fewer could lack the power to sustain hover. This test confirmed that the Raptors could throttle down sufficiently to achieve zero vertical velocity, a key milestone for reusability. During the hover, the booster demonstrated remarkable poise. Sensors aboard the vehicle monitored parameters such as altitude, attitude, and engine performance in real time. The grid fins, extended during descent, helped stabilize the booster against any crosswinds or perturbations. Visuals from the test show plumes of exhaust interacting with the water surface, creating a misty halo around the landing zone. This interaction is crucial to study, as it simulates the exhaust effects near the tower during a catch attempt. The successful hover underscored the maturity of SpaceX's guidance, navigation, and control systems which rely on a combination of GPS, inertial measurement units, and proprietary algorithms to maintain precision. Following the hover, the engines shut down as planned, allowing the booster to freefall the remaining distance into the ocean. Upon impact, the vehicle exploded in what SpaceX humorously terms a Rapid Schedule Disassembly, RSD a common outcome for these ocean splashdowns due to the structural stresses and residual propellants. While the explosion was not shown in the official video release, eyewitness accounts and secondary footage confirm the dramatic conclusion. This deliberate disposal ensures no recoverable hardware poses environmental risks, aligning with regulatory requirements for test flights. The data collected from this maneuver is invaluable. Engineers will analyze telemetry to refine models for thrust vectoring and propellant slosh dynamics during low-speed operations. One key insight is the engine relight reliability. Despite the earlier failure, the system's redundancy allowed for a seamless recovery. This builds confidence for Flight 12 and beyond, where Block 3 boosters with integrated hot staging and Raptor 3 engines will attempt actual tower catches the transition to Block 3 promises enhanced performance, including higher thrust and improved heat shielding, paving the way for rapid reusability. Now, if you are interested to watch a quick recap of Flight 11, stay here. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have liftoff. Go Super Heavy, go Starship. Thanks for all the historic flights, Pad 1. Vehicles catching downrange. Booster Raptor chamber pressure nominal. See the engines throttling down. Booster engine cut off. Ship ignition. Stage separation. Use back burn startup. All 
All right, successful hot staging maneuver. So we've got 12 of the 13 engines lit back up on boosters, so it's doing its boost back. Real, real excitingly, ship, though, ship we've got six out of six Raptors lit on ship there, so it's now going to continue to make its ascent into outer space. And as we're starting to get into the denser part of the atmosphere, the booster is using four hypersonic grid fins to guide itself through atmospheric entry towards its landing site. And we're just ship, about 20 seconds away from landing burn start, where we'll ig first ignite the center 13 engines, then bring that down to five to slow down the booster for landing. And finally, that will come down to three, and we'll cut all of them off while we're still about 200 meters in the air. So, Booster is going to see a bit of a part of it. Booster landing, we'll start it. Booster landing, we're shut down. And there we heard it, booster landing burn shutdown. We saw a 13 to 5 to 3 V3, V3 demonstration. And into the water we go. Less than 30 seconds to go in this ship ascent burn. All right, our vacs have shut off. Three more to go. Ship engine cut off. All right, all ship Raptors have shut Nominal down. Nominal orbit insertion. Yeah, and anybody that's been following Starship, you know, Starlink's kind of the MVP for these flight tests where it's not only giving us the views we're seeing right now, uh, but also just real-time data through every phase of flight. So we've got a couple dozen cameras on Starship. We've also got a bunch of cameras spread across the globe, including out in the Indian Ocean where we've got our fun buoys floating. There goes another one. And I mean, we're, we're using Starlink to bring all of this together. It's our, our drone shots you see here uh, from our great team down here at Starbase, all connected. So Starlink, not only giving us cool views off the planet, but also on the planet, help bring everybody along for all these Starship flights. E3. So yeah, Starlink provides us with all one more path to collect data and help us rapidly iterate Starship's design. And if the ship does manage to make it all the way to re-entry, we'll collect valuable data on the spacecraft flying through the Earth's atmosphere at hypersonic speeds or more than five times the speed of sound. Re-entry is typically a portion of flight where we don't have communications with spacecraft because it's re-entering at or around orbital velocity, which is roughly eight kilometers per second or five miles per second. At those insanely high speeds, the spacecraft moving through the atmosphere creates a plasma field around the vehicle. Yeah, and that blanket of plasma distorts communication frequencies, so it's not uncommon to experience brief blackouts in communication. Um, so we should be just about a minute and a half where, again, as Amanda just said, we're going to relight one of those center engines. This, is, this will be the third time that we've tried this. Uh, we did it successfully back on Flight 10, and then we did it for the very first time back on Flight 6. Uh, this is not a deorbit burn. This is demonstrating essentially all of the systems you would need to do a deorbit burn. So that's obviously your Raptor engine, uh, and then also your, your header tanks, your smaller tanks uh, in the nose cone, where we have liquid oxygen, liquid methane, and a smaller, more easily pressurized container, which we can use for on-orbit burns. And we're also gonna tap into those when we do our landing burn. Um, so this will be a critical capability. Once we go to full orbital missions, you'll have to do a deorbit burn to break out of orbit, send it back down to Earth. Uh, but in this instance, we're already on our way back down towards Earth. Um, so this is just going to demonstrate the capability of turning one of these engines on. We should be coming up in just about 20 seconds or so, looking for one of those Raptor engines to turn back on. They've been off uh, since we completed that 
successful ascent burn uh, almost 30 minutes ago. Here we go. Oh, rapid ignition. And shut down. All right, there was that Raptor relight. Looks like engine three, full duration. As Dan mentioned, that's the third attempt, and we just did it three times in a row. So congrats to the team, the ship nominal team, Raptor orbital. team. And then there we heard nominal second orbital insertion. All right, so congrats everyone on the milestone. Vehicle is now at maximum dynamic pressure. All right, that was basically our reverse max Q. So most aerodynamic stress that it's going to see during re-entry, we just passed through it. So we're past that, we're past peak heating. Shipping is, the ship is making its turn for final approach. And here's this kind of aggressive final turn that would essentially position it so it's right behind the launch and catch tower. Flaps holding strong. Landing burn in just under 20 seconds. Ship landing startup. There's our landing burn. Three down to two. Starship has landed. Thanks for watching today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for another great video tomorrow.